is going on guys and welcome back to another episode of the E36 M3 Drift Car Project. And uh, yeah, I might have broke it. So, <laughs> a couple things. This car actually just had an awesome time at Riverside. I say just, it's been a little over a month since Riverside. And I had a great time seeing all my friends and getting to hang out with people I haven't seen in basically a year. Um, but some unfortunate things did happen. And so starting it off, we actually did, I say we, I demolished, it's much better now than it was, but I demolished this fender, unfortunately. Kind of had a bit of an instance where I dipped the other side's tire off of the road, loaded up this side, and since, since I don't have the sway bar in, I actually dug the side of the tire or the sidewall of the tire into the fender, caught it, sucked it in while I was turning to angle, and unfortunately we had to pull it out by hand just to get it on the trailer. Totaled the nose panel as well as breaking the turn signal light, and it all just kind of sucks. But the good news is, is that this fender, along with the other one, um, were basically smoked already. They're rusty. The lip, as you can see, was already rolled completely flat. And it stinks because, I don't know if you guys can tell because the car is dirty, but this thing actually just got back from paint correction and polish. And the guys at Insane Paint absolutely knocked this thing out of the park. I could not be happier. And finally got the LTW wing looking right. Now, as you can see here, we have new, I say new, new to me OBD2 OEM fenders. These are from an unfortunate situation, a Sierra Rot convertible that was unfortunately totaled due to a rear end collision. Came up for sale relatively local to me and I went ahead and snagged them. Still gonna order a nose panel and we've already started making a list of new parts required. Um, this was just a rudimentary list right off the top of my head. So, unfortunately though, that's not the only thing that happened. If I were to fire this thing up right now, let's just say she's kind of running like a two-stroke. And if we look over here, yeah, nobody wants to see one of these. But I think we need to go ahead and do it, and I can't even lie, I've kind of felt like this is something I should do since I got the car. Um, just to be frank with you guys, the previous oil change I did on the car did have bearing material in it. and. I kind of put it off thinking that potentially because I'd had the oil pan off, a couple things might have happened. I might have gotten some gunk in the system that might have weared the bearings a little bit, wore, weared, whatever. Um, that's a potential first thing that could have happened. I also think that potentially there could have been some normal wear for 200,000 plus miles that when I used the diesel engine oil that I did, might have been pulled out. Um, the filter did have some particulate in it. Um, however, the reason why I think I need to start with a compression test is because last time I did spark plugs on this car, cylinder four was completely full of oil, which could tell me one of two things. That could potentially be worn piston rings, which would come up on a compression test as low compression, or it could be a valve seal issue. Um, and I say valve seals as in valve guide seals. So that is really what I'm leaning towards that it is. And so in that case, my thought process would be that if we do this compression test and we get good results across the board, it just needs valve seals. The other thing is what happened was the car got stuck in a gridlock traffic jam while I was driving it to Insane Paint. And I got a, a check engine light and I started hucking smoke. And the check engine light came back as a cylinder four misfire, which again, could be one of two things. It could be low compression, too much oil in the cylinder, misfire, or it could be too much oil in the cylinder, misfire because of a valve seal issue. So I've got a list right here. We're gonna go ahead and pull all of the spark plugs as well as the coil packs. I've gotta go ahead and start by removing this strut bar and then we'll go from there. I've never done a compression test before, but I went ahead and warmed up the engine I don't really think it's gonna matter. I think if you've got no compression or very little, it's gonna show really all we're trying to do here. I don't care about the actual number as you've probably heard people say before. 
I just care about discrepancies. I want to see a relatively even, I think the rule of thumb is like 15 or 20% at max variance across the board between the different cylinders. So I'm not really looking forward to this because I'm nervous, but you know, we got to do it. We got to get it done. That way we can come up with a plan for what steps are next. So nothing to it, but to do it, let's go ahead and get started. So I needed to take a second and stop. Check out the ignition coils on this car. All of them look like they're original BMW Bremi. And then you get to this one. And someone's put an X on it, and cylinder four is my problem cylinder. That's the one that was full of oil, like I mentioned. Someone's put an X on it, and the date code is done in this sort of X and dash system, as opposed to these, which look like they're from original from 1997. This is bizarre. I don't really know what the deal is with this. And you know, you might be thinking, okay, well you might just have a bad ignition coil. Well, I don't really think that would explain oil consumption. So we're still gonna do the compression test, but someone has been here before and someone knows that something is going on in this hole in particular. So let's keep digging. So unfortunately, as you guys can see, we do have a somewhat significant problem with cylinder four and a marginal problem with cylinder three. Um, it kind of sucks. Kind of was hoping that it would just end up being a valve seal problem, but it looks like I'm not going to get away scot-free like that, like I'd hoped. So 
kind of brainstorming ideas, there is a couple options here. Um, number one, the engine's got to come out either way. Um, the cheapest, I don't know if this will be the cheapest in the end, but more than likely it would be barely cheaper, would be to just rebuild this S52 myself. Um, I mean, I'm pretty confident I could do it, figure it out. But the problem is that still leaves me with an engine set up in the car that's not, I mean, if I'm doing all this work, what I'm saying is I don't know if that's where I want to stay is with an S52. Then there moves into other options like S54, which is pretty, that would be pretty rad to me. And then there moves into even crazier options like JZ or LS, but then that starts to really get really complicated, really expensive, and I don't know. I gotta think about it. I also gotta make sure to cross my T's and dot my I's and make sure that this isn't potentially a problem with something in the cylinder head. I don't know enough about, I guess, just engines in general and problems with engines to say that it's not something just in the cylinder head. So, but yeah, uh, got my work cut out for me. I'll go ahead and show you guys. These are the final compression results. As you can see, cylinder one, 202, cylinder two, 202. Cylinder three starts to drop to 171. Cylinder four, which is the problem cylinder, and as you can see, the spark plug is just nuked. We only had 108 PSI, which is better than zero, but still not good. Cylinder five, things move back up, 212. Cylinder six, 200. So that tells me that we've definitely got a problem with cylinder four, and then cylinder three, something is not totally stoked there, but it's okay. But cylinder four is our main problem. So like I said, I need a bit of time to kind of think about what I want to do, what I'm willing to do, how much money I want to spend, how much time I want to spend. But one way or another, we got a big job ahead of us. And it sucks because I really wanted this S52 to last. And I wanted to get out on track with this engine as it was because, you know, I like doing all the other stuff around the car, but like I wanted to stay stock S52 power for as long as possible because I don't want to completely overbuild this car with an engine swap, but I'm also not opposed to it because I've always wanted to do an engine swap, so I'm a little bummed, I can't even lie, but we'll figure it out, we'll figure everything else out, and in the meantime, while we're waiting for stuff for this, I do plan to get back into doing stuff to this car. So, things are gonna work out how they're meant to work out, and we'll go from here. Right now, I'm going to go take a break, and then I'm gonna think a little bit, do a little bit of research, and we'll come up with a plan. I don't know when this is gonna pick back up, but uh, I'm gonna put all the spark plugs and everything back in this thing just so it can still move around. It's not a paperweight. And we'll go from there. So yeah, catch you guys sometime in the future. What is going on, guys? It's a new day, and I have a new, fresh, mental mindset plan course of action here. Um, done some homework, um, just so you guys know, I actually have never had any engine problems in any of my cars, especially not uh, my other E36. This thing runs absolutely flawlessly and I give a lot of credit to the fact that I've always been the one who's owned it. But this one, uh, being a 14 owner car, probably has had some pretty rough history and so we've got some work to do to fix it. But anyways, I've done some thinking yesterday and some learning, and as it turns out, as I'm sure a lot of you know, low compression doesn't always mean bottom end like worn piston rings. It could also be valves, um, like bent valves potentially, or it could be a head gasket failure. Those are the other two possibilities it could be. So what I've got today is actually, I went to Harbor Freight and picked up Harbor Freight's finest leak down tester. Now, if you guys don't know what a leak down tester does, essentially it's going to be done in a very similar way to the compression test I did yesterday. I'm going to thread an end down into each cylinder. Um, you could just do the two that the compression test pointed out as potential problem cylinders, but just for safe measure, I'm gonna start with those two, but I'm also gonna do all six and record my findings. And essentially, here's how it works. If we get air into the um, coolant overflow tank, we know we've got a blown head gasket, which would be, sounds bad, but that would be such a nice relief. That would be the cheapest and easiest thing to fix. Next up on the list is if we hear air through the intake, 
then we know we've got bent or damaged intake valves, valve seats, or like, you know, the valves actually sit down in the cylinder head, um, bad valve seats. If we hear air through the exhaust, which is gonna be a little difficult because the full exhaust is on the car, but we should still be able to hear it. And odds are, if exhaust valves are bent, so will intake valves be. It's not like you'll just bend exhaust valves, that would be really weird. Um, we'll hear that too. Then worst case scenario, if we hear air coming back through like the oil filler cap, we'll know we've got a bottom end um, problem because that will be air pressurizing the crankcase, which means it's leaking down past the piston into the oil system and it will go up um, through the oil passageways and will bleed air into the crankcase, which we will hear in the form of air rushing out of the oil filler cap. So with all that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and I've actually, I completely reassembled the engine yesterday, which kind of stinks. So as you guys can see here, I wanna be really gentle with this because these hood struts don't play any games. I put everything back together because I was kind of defeated yesterday and I kind of thought, okay, well, motor's toast, so I might as well just put it back together so that this thing can still move around. And guess what I gotta do now? I gotta take it all back apart, but if I just did it yesterday, it's not that hard to do. So let's go ahead and take this thing back apart and we'll do a cylinder leak down test. So since you guys saw this yesterday, I think I will use a little bit of YouTube magic here to get the strut bar, cover off, um, coil packs, and spark plugs. So if we just do a little something like, uh, a little something like, oh, okay, that was pretty easy. Only took about two seconds to do all that. So anyways, now we're gonna go ahead and get the leak down tester hooked up. I'm gonna start back here with cylinder four and we'll go from there. So as you can see, I've got the car up on ramps because I obliviously forgot that doing a leak down test, you actually have to put the engine at top dead center or put the cylinder that you're trying to measure at the compression stroke on top dead center. So of course to do that, I've gotta turn the crank pulley and um, on E36s, if you still have your stock mechanical clutch fan, you just simply can't access it from the top. So I'm going to try and access it from the bottom. I'll show you guys kind of my little rig and how I've got it planned to be able to find top dead center. Um, I'm learning as I go, but we're going to keep on rolling. So this right here is the crankshaft bolt. This is what we're gonna be turning to rotate the engine. So we're just gonna go ahead and turn this and I'll show you what we need to monitor up top to know when we need to stop. Okay guys. After feeling like an idiot for what feels like forever, I know for a fact I've got the engine at top dead center on cylinder four on the compression stroke. And uh, yeah, I'll just let these results speak for themselves because I've already done this. That is not exactly ideal. And there is a large amount of air coming out of the crankcase and if I pull the dipstick you will hear the oil gurgling. Well, I need to close this. That's not exactly great. So just so you guys can see what I'm talking about, the dipstick is pulled up just a little bit. If I close this, yep, that is something with the piston rings more than likely. What's going on guys? Once again, it's another day. This is a long process of diagnosing this thing because I wanna make sure we cross off every T, dot every I, 
and I want to make sure before I start pulling this engine out that everything is confirmed, right? So, as you saw, we've confirmed we've got a problem with cylinder four. It's looking like piston rings or some sort of damage to the piston or the cylinder walls in cylinder four. I've got some suspicions and we'll talk about conclusions from my uneducated um, guesses at the end of this video, which we're almost there. But one of the last things I wanna do is like a very, very last ditch effort. I know this is kinda like snake oil kinda stuff, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and give it a try. We are going to attempt to let some sea foam sit inside cylinder four for a few days. What I'm planning on doing is pouring a bit, we're actually gonna do cylinder three as well because remember on our compression test, it showed slightly lower compression as well. Um, I'm gonna try to get the pistons, cylinder three and four, it's nice. They're gonna be moving at the exact same location inside the engine. So what I'll do is I'll try to get it to somewhere between the highest and the lowest point of the, um, the stroke of the rod and I'll set it somewhere in the middle. I'll show you guys how I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna pour, I don't know how much yet, but a couple ounces or an ounce or two of sea foam into each cylinder. I'm gonna rock the crank back and forth just a little bit. I'm also going to add seven ounces of sea foam to the oil. And I'm gonna, after that, I've also got over here, I've got new spark plugs, as you can see right here. So after I go ahead and put everything back together with the new spark plugs, I'm gonna run it with the seafoam and the oil up to operating temperature, give it a few revs, nothing crazy because the seafoam will dilute the oil. And then after that, it's not cheap oil, but I've got Mobile One. Um, I've actually got seven quarts of this stuff. Normally I run Royal Purple XPR in this engine, but that stuff is incredibly expensive. So we're gonna run Mobile One along with a fresh filter. We're gonna heat the engine up one more time and once the actual good oil's in it, we're gonna give it some serious revs. I'm gonna put her on the chip and get it to full operating temperature, cycle everything out, and then our very final test will be one final compression test. If that final compression test still comes back as 102 PSI or somewhere right around that, hopefully not lower, that would be bad. <laughs> but if it still comes to that, We'll talk about conclusions, but this engine will 100% be coming out at that point. Um, it's probably gonna come out either way, but regardless, we need to make sure because this is going to be expensive. So, if we're gonna spend a bunch of money, we need to make sure we have crossed every possibility and exhausted every option off. So, with that said, I'm gonna show you guys how I'm gonna measure where middle of the stroke is and we're gonna keep going. So essentially what I'm gonna do here is I've got this extension, gizmo, whatever, rigged up with some tape, and I'm gonna rotate the crank over. I'm actually gonna get my dad to help me, and we're gonna mark the point based off of this plane right here, which the piston is at its absolute highest. Then we're gonna mark the lowest. Then we're gonna pick the point dead in the center by measuring between the two points, and we're gonna line the crankshaft there. That way the piston is about dead middle of its travel. We made marks for all three positions. It's about a 60 millimeter um, stroke or something in that ballpark if I measured it correctly. And that's the center mark. And I don't know if you're gonna be able to see this, but lines up just about even with the, yeah, you can't see that, but Lines up just about even with this silver um, coil pack bolt down location. So, now that that is taken care of, we are going to go ahead and measure out some sea foam and put it in cylinder three and four, and then rock the crank back and forth a little bit. I'm actually thinking we're just gonna do one ounce for now, and I'm gonna see how that leaks down in the cylinder. So, I'm gonna go ahead, I've got this sea foam can opened, and then measure out one eighth of a cup is right about there. I figure we don't want to go overboard because using too much of this, um, we're gonna have to evacuate this and we do not want to hydro lock the engine. So I'm actually gonna put this into cylinder three and four and I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna look down in the cylinder and just see how full it is because I don't know how full it's gonna be. So we wanna make sure we're covering the entire piston. Bottoms up, S52. So it doesn't even look like the cylinder's remotely close to full and I want it on all sides of the piston. So we're gonna do one more ounce. Oh, 
All right, so that looks like it did the trick. So this time we actually have two ounces. That's a decent bet. So, all right, let's do it. Um, we're gonna add three quarters of a cup or six ounces of seafoam to the actual crankcase and the motor oil. Um, this is, the, the seafoam recommends that you do a ratio of one quart for every, um, wait, one, one ounce for every quart of oil in the crankcase. Obviously this thing's been burning oil, so we're gonna go with six. Just feels right. So, ooh, Griffin, don't spill this. This stuff is probably not nice to paint. There it goes. So now all that's left is I'm gonna get underneath here and I'm just gonna rock the crank back and forth. And this is just to kinda move the sea foam around just a little bit to let it kinda get around the rings potentially. Um, not gonna do much, we're talking just a gentle rock back and forth. And uh, that should be it. You won't be able to see me do this, but I'll check back in um, probably about this time tomorrow. Okay guys, so it's been about a week since that last clip. And as of right now, I've just been super busy. And I went ahead and just let the seafoam sit in the cylinders. I actually did add one more round of seafoam. Now we're on a final third one. And we're actually gonna cycle the engine over with the starter for this. And just as a safety precaution, I've taken a towel, put it across the cylinders to catch any sea foam or anything else in the cylinder that may come out, as well as taped off the connectors for the coil packs um, because they will have power and they probably will be supplying. It won't necessarily spark, but just as a safety measure, I just want to be sure. And then, let's see, so yeah, so you're going to go ahead. I added um, one quarter cup of sea foam to cylinder four. We're going to go ahead and turn the engine over on the starter and we're just going to let it cycle. Then we're going to put it back together and get it fired up. You guys have seen me do this a hundred times. We're gonna get all the spark plugs back in the engine, the original spark plugs, not the fresh ones, and we're gonna get this thing fired up. Okay, so it's time for the first fire up. I went ahead and changed out the spark plugs. It's got fresh spark plugs inside of the engine, and all the coil packs are back in. Bear in mind, there's a lot of sea foam in this engine, so we're probably gonna get a lot of smoke. That should be relatively normal. Hopefully nothing else weird happens. Give it a minute, it hasn't warmed up yet. Usually on cold start, it wouldn't smoke, it would uh, get warmed up. All right guys, so we have the sea foam going in the engine right now. As you guys can see, this thing is smoking like crazy. And that's likely a combo of more than one thing. It's probably not just the, uh, whatever problem we're facing with the engine to begin with, but this is also because of the sea foam. As you can see, this whole garage is currently filled up with smoke. So, yeah, there is, uh, there is a lot. But it is running. It did produce a check engine code, which I'm assuming is a cylinder four misfire. The engine sort of sputtered and shook for just a moment. Um, there might have been a little bit of stuff or sea foam uh, build up inside of cylinder four. But as of right now, I'm gonna let it run. We're gonna get up the operating temperature and then I'm gonna idle it for a little longer. And then the next step will be to get it up in the air, change the oil, run it one more time, and then pull the plugs and do our final compression test to confirm if we have a dead S52. So, we'll see. Oh, that wasn't bad. Wow, guys, this oil definitely smells like fuel. I have the magnetic drain plug from the engine 
and I don't know how well you guys are going to be able to see this, but uh, obviously we have some sort of slight problem because that is a decent bit of metal. So, yeah. Here's just a quick look at the oil that came out of the car. I don't know how well you're gonna be able to see this, but you can kind of see some of the trail right there. There is definitely copper in this oil, which is indicative that we're wearing the um, bearings. Um, if I had to guess, which I'll discuss all my conclusions at the end, I just had to guess that this is because of particulate in the engine from another source that I will discuss shortly, but you're not gonna be able to see this super, super well, but I figured you guys might like to take a look. All right, we've got an examination of the oil filter here. I don't know how much of that you guys can really see, but that's certainly not. Let's just pick another random one. Ooh, yeah, this is a good one. Oh, ooh, yeah. All that shiny stuff in there, that is metal. There's a little more. Mmm, crunchy. Oh my goodness. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay, we've got the oil changed in this thing and we are gonna go ahead and fire it up. And then after this, we'll do our final compression test and we will see what we get. Let's go. So the last thing I want to mention before we start talking potential diagnosis is that this thing does not have a blown head gasket. A lot of people keep on telling me they think that's what it is. I'm telling you this thing is not mixing oil and coolant. Um, it passed a leak down test for the head gasket. It would have immediately shown up. 
doesn't have a blown head gasket. You can see that is fresh blue BMW coolant in there. If it'll focus maybe. If you get the picture, you can tell it's blue. There's no oil in that coolant. So, yep. Oh boy. So, here we are. Yeah, she's dead. 221,802 miles later. Um, let's see, 26 years, 14 owners, a trip from, in my possession, a trip from Maine to Mississippi, thousands of miles. Um, she's dead. Not the car, but the engine. It's a little sad, I can't even lie, because being an E36 enthusiast like I am, um, these engines are special. You could argue that this S52 is, you know, it's not that special. It's just a bored out version of what's in this car right here. Um, and you know, the US market really did get screwed with these M3s, but at the same time, it's unique and it's cool. It's like the US did get something different than any other country. We sort of got a hot rod, sort of an M52 that was, had all the bulletproof nature of the M52, but with a little bit more power. I mean, you can't argue that these are more reliable than the European S50s. They just are. They're simpler engines. Um, but here we are, and this one's dead. So, what do I think happened? Okay, so, after everything that I have looked at with this engine, I've come to the conclusion that I'm almost positive that there was a fueling issue with cylinder four. I think that it was overfueling cylinder four. Likely the entire second bank of cylinders, but because of the nature of the runners, I'm almost positive we were overfueling cylinder four. So, why did that happen? That I don't know. The resistor wired into the second bank O2 sensor is suspicious. Um, I feel like that's something for the tune. I've talked to a couple people and apparently Castle Performance does something similar. Um, maybe it's some sort of way to get around tuning back in the day, because I'm pretty sure this thing has a dine-in tune on it and was tuned a long time ago, more than likely. Um, and I'm pretty sure we've sort of washed the cylinder walls out in cylinder four and that the piston, I've heard knocking-ish noises coming from this thing that I'm almost positive are piston slap. So basically I think that the cylinder bore has been overboard by the piston moving too much because the cylinder walls are worn and the piston is just in there shaking against the cylinder wall. I don't think it's the rings. I literally think it is a damaged block. I think the block itself is damaged, which explain why most of the metallics that are coming out of this thing are silver. They're iron. They're not copper. I mean, there was some copper in the oil but it's sort of inevitable when you've got metal running through your oil that you're gonna get some bearing wear because the oil, oil pump is gonna suck that metal up. I mean, your oil filter is only gonna do so much. It's only filtering the oil once it gets all the way to the filter after the pump. So I'm sure the pump has probably got a little damage, um, but it is pumping metallic filled oil into the bearings, so the bearings are gonna take some wear and tear. Um, but yeah. I bet everything on this engine is probably fine except the block. Um, that would be my guess. I doubt the pistons are damaged. I doubt the crankshaft is damaged. I know the head is fine. The head gasket is fine. The camshafts are probably fine. So what I'm going to do next, I'm not 100% sure um, as far as with this engine, however, I do have something I want to do, and it is something that I've wanted to do since I was 13 or 14 years old and watched my friend Jay's build one of these. And that is, I want to put a 1JZ, cue some noises. put a 1JZ in this M3. And I'm not just talking any 1J, not a NA to GE, none of that crap. Not even a non-VVTI like we got it here in America in the Mark III Supra. I want a VVTI 1J out of like a JZX 110. And I 
found one. And I have a deposit down on it. We will talk more about the specifics of that setup in the future, but it's gonna be a big job, it's a lot of money. I know I could probably rebuild this S52 and I could probably do it for a couple thousand dollars or I could buy another one for like 3,500, which is what they go for about now. But that's not what I want. I want more power, but I really want that Jay-Z noise and I've wanted a 1 Jay-Z forever and that's what we're gonna do. So, this car is gonna be down for a minute and it's kinda sad because I had just gotten it polished. I had just had Riverside. Now I did crunch this fender, so we'll have to get that fixed too, which is a, that's not a big deal. We'll, we'll get that sorted. It is just kind of unfortunate. The timing does suck. However, um, this is gonna be for the good in the long run. Um, 1Js are bulletproof. They're amazing engines. And I think you guys are gonna like the method with which I'm gonna swap it. Um, I've sort of already got my head fully wrapped around how I want to do it. And yeah, I know this was a long video, but I wanted to be very thorough with this. This is one of the most expensive decisions I've ever made. I'm going to spend more on this engine and swap setup than I did on this entire M3. So I needed to be positive that I'd exhausted all of my options. Now that I know that I have, I feel much more comfortable going into what's next. So yeah. You guys should uh, stay tuned. We're gonna do the whole Jay-Z swap series on the channel. It's not gonna start for a little bit. Um, I'm gonna turn my attention after, well, we gotta pull this motor. So that's gonna be what you're gonna see next is me starting to pull this engine out and um, part it out and we're gonna sell some stuff off of it that I obviously can't reuse from the Jay-Z to fund the Jay-Z and the swap parts. So stay tuned. And uh, after the motor's pulled, that's when we're gonna turn to the convertible and the convertible will get some love and we're gonna start by fixing the accident damage. Lots of good things are happening. I've missed being here on YouTube. Hope you guys enjoyed this video and was interested in the carnage that's going on inside this thing. It's sad. I'm gonna put a little montage here at the end of some of my favorite, even though there were few moments behind the wheel of this thing, making some S52 noises. I still think this was one of the best sounding S52s I'd ever heard um, without ITBs. And yeah, hope you guys enjoy this little compilation. Thank you so much for watching. Keep your heads up. You guys are doing so much better than you think you are. Give yourself a little bit more credit. Be easy on yourself. Love yourself. And uh, I'll see you guys later. Have a great rest of your night or day or morning. Anyways, love you guys. See ya.